turn the floor over to Cyrus. I'll turn the floor over to Cyrus to introduce the um, interpreters. Sounds good. Thanks, Jill. Uh, we'll start with uh, Aurora and then we'll go to New. Hey, buenos días. Mi nombre es Aurora. Voy a ser su intérprete de español el día de hoy para esta reunión con los comisionados. Gracias. Hi, everyone. My name is New. I will be the Vietnamese interpreter for the meeting this morning. Xin chào mọi người. Tôi tên là Như và sẽ hỗ trợ thông dịch sai tiếng Việt cho buổi sáng ngày hôm nay, cho cuộc họp buổi sáng ngày hôm nay. Xin cảm ơn. Thank you. Sounds good. The interpretation channels are now open. So back to you, Joe. Thank you. Um, thank you for joining the Boston Zoning Commission public hearing, which is being held virtually to ensure the safety of the public, staff members, and the Boston Zoning Commissioners during the COVID-19 pandemic. The open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made. At this time, I'll take a roll call of the members at the beginning of the meeting. Myself, Jill Hatton, present. Mr. Nichols? Present. Ms. Morikawa? Present. Mr. Marr? I think we're waiting on um, Mr. Marr. Ms. Miller? Present. Mr. Leff? Present. Mr. Arroyo? Present. Mr. Ostrich? Present. Okay, thank you. Before we start the hearing, Jeff Hampton um, would like to make a few remarks, so I'll turn the floor over to Jeff. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the commission. As you can see, uh, ex-chairman Jay Hurley is not on this call today. Uh, he His term with the zoning commission has come to an end. I would just like to acknowledge and thank Jay for his 21 years of service uh, to the city of Boston and to this zoning commission with the last, I think it was 11 years as chairman. Uh, I just wanted to put that on the record to acknowledge and thank him for his service to the city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And I think um, clearly the commissioners agree with that um, comment. Jay has been uh, a pleasure to, to be um, associated with on this commission, so we will miss him. All right, at this time, I'll start the nine o'clock public hearing. This is a public hearing before the Boston Zoning Commission to consider map amendment application number 784 submitted by the trustees of Cedar Grove Cemetery. The hearing was duly advertised on August 21st, 2024 in the Boston Herald. In a Boston Zoning Commission hearing on proposed petitions, the proponent will first present their case and are subject to questioning by members of the commission only. We're taking support and opposition at the same time. If you're planning to testify, please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active. Click the hand icon on your Zoom control panel. This will signal staff that you would like to speak. When your hand is raised, it will be blue. If you're calling into the meeting and would like to testify, please dial star nine to raise your hand. When I call for all testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must unmute your microphone. Your webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. Commission staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain. At that time, please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. Finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. At this time, I would ask the petitioner to please, please begin the presentation. I believe Charlie Tevnen, um, representing Cedar Grove, will make the presentation. Charlie, you're on mute. I apologize. Um, good morning, Madam Chair, and members of the Zoning Commission. I'm a. Uh, my name is Charlie Tevnin. I'm an attorney with a business address of 15 Broad Street, Boston, and a residential address of 4 Fairfax Street in Dorchester. I'm here on behalf of the applicant Cedar Grove Cemetery regarding this longstanding petition to rezone approximately 15,876 square feet of land at 97 Milton Street, Dorchester from Open Space Cemetery to 1F5000. The Cedar Grove Cemetery is a nonprofit organization established in 1867, is comprised of over 55 acres of land 
in the city of Boston and is governed by a volunteer board of trustees of which I am a member and have been for a number of years. Nearly all of the volunteer trustees reside uh, nearby in Dorchester and have a stake in the cemetery's continuation as a uh, longstanding resource for the community and the entire city of Boston as a quiet place on the banks of the Neponset River. Many notable people are interred in the cemetery, just uh, for historical reference, including Congressional Medal of Honor recipients James Verney and Wilman Blackmar, former uh, Boston Mayor George Hibbard, Boston Firefighter Stephen Minahan, Massachusetts State Trooper Paul Barry, and Boston City Councilor Jimmy Kelly. The commission may also be aware of the cemetery's distinction as the only cemetery in the United States and perhaps the world with a trolley line running through it, the MBTA Mattapan Ashmont uh, trolley line. There are a number of structures within the cemetery, including the cemetery owned single family residence at 97 Milton Street. This is the property which we are requesting to be rezoned, 15,876 square feet of land located near the corner of Milton Street and Granite Avenue. Um, and if the commission could please uh, uh, show, uh, or Jeff, if you could please show exhibit one, uh, the it's a map showing all 34 sections of the cemetery with the red arrow pointing to this location within the cemetery uh, in the northeast corner of the cemetery. Um, the This property at 97 Milton Street, while it is currently zoned as open space cemetery, it has long been residential in nature. The house which is shown in the photo submitted as exhibit three is the 100 year old single family residence uh, owned by the cemetery, which for many years was set aside for use by the cemetery superintendent. However, the existing structure shown in the photo has been unoccupied for several years and is currently not habitable. The commission members may recall that the zoning commission has approved rezoning of certain areas of the cemetery twice in the past few years. In 2016, the cemetery petitioned the commission to rezone approximately 20,000 square feet of property along uh, Granite Ave from open space uh, cemetery to uh, for residential purposes. The commission granted this request. And as part of the cemetery's related capital plan, uh, the cemetery then sold this property and utilized the proceeds to develop and maintain sections elsewhere in the cemetery, as well as to acquire approximately one acre of residential property in the rear yards along Adam Street on the uh, other side of the cemetery. And then in 2021, the Zoning Commission approved a separate uh, rezoning petition for that one acre of residential land to convert it uh, for cemetery use. We are requesting that this property be rezoned to 1F5000 because it is the lowest zoning designation and because that designation would be comparable to the existing zoning in the area. There are abutting single family, two family and three family structures along Milton Street and on nearby Granite Ave. Uh, exhibits 10 through 12 in support of the petition and one of the uh, renderings is uh, on the screen, uh, shows a proposed six unit project, which if the zoning commission approves this petition, the cemetery intends to present this project to the uh, community and ultimately to the Zoning Board of Appeal. This rezoning and the related six unit project is again uh, part of the cemetery's capital plan to utilize the proceeds from this project in which the cemetery will act as the developer uh, to develop and maintain burial sections elsewhere in the cemetery, uh, which are more suitable for burials than this location. At this point, I would like to turn the presentation over to acting superintendent and fellow trustee Tony Pasciulli, who can discuss this rezoning proposal a little further and answer any questions which you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. 
Uh, good morning to everybody, and thank you for uh, taking the time to speak with us this morning. I know you're all very busy. I cannot speak as eloquently as Charlie on some of the points, but let me give you a little bit of history and how I kind of got involved in this. Eight or nine years ago, well, I've spent 30 years of my working career in Dorchester, and eight or nine years ago, I was asked by the cemetery to um, consider becoming a trustee. In doing so, and the treasurer, I looked at over the finances, and we realized at that time that the cemetery was down to only approximately uh, 100 to 200 potential grave sites. There is a a, a patent throughout uh, New England because land is so expensive and it's so difficult to come by that a lot of cemeteries have been told been turned over to municipalities because they've not been able to support themselves through the sale and the ongoing efforts to keep a cemetery running. At that time, we did a, a major review of the cemetery. We had some areas that were, were backfilled that were gullies and unused land, and we started filling those to make of potential grave sites. And as Charlie said, we had acquired some property, we did some rezoning, et cetera. At this point, we've enhanced the future of the cemetery tremendously with the help of the city, the city's support of our efforts. And we've got the cemetery to a point where we think it will continue to be self-supporting and sustainable over a period of time as we continue to develop the land that we have and try to build our endowment and capital going forward. That said, what brings us the first question, well, why would you want to sell this piece of land? This particular piece of land sits dominantly on ledge. If this is approved, we'll be building these units with no basements. When you sit on ledge, it's very difficult to develop for grave sites because right now we're trying to keep the grave sites affordable for the folks of Dorchester and surrounding communities. So Premium sites are going for ten to twelve thousand dollars a site. Sites on land like this would go for eight. But by the time we were digging through the rock and and are potentially blasting, it would not be cost effective to develop. So it only leaves you the ability of building up and putting these very tall uh, mausoleum type structures there, which would not fit the community, would not fit the residential abutters at all. Would be somewhat. Uh, unattractive to look out your window and see an eight foot high structure directly across the street. So in looking at this uh, and trying to build our finances, as Charlie said, we we spent a lot of time on this, like what would fit the community, what would enhance the community, and what would look appropriate in the community. And we came up with the proposal of these three two unit buildings with a lot of green space, a lot of parking, two two parking spaces per unit. And the overall appeal, this is a rendering, there'll be some, would be some alterations of course, but this is the idea of what we want to build. These attractive two unit structures with a lot of green space, so they fit the community, not a large building that's kind of overbearing or just draws your eye is not fitting the location. It'd be approximately a thousand square feet each Hopefully, uh, we will continue along that path. They will be of uh, moderate pricing going forward. Uh, they will be. They will have nice amenities, but they will not be over the top because we want to keep these affordable and fitting with the community. Although I'm not sure what the definition is right now of affordable, but we're hoping to keep these reasonably priced to make them uh, more appeal within the community. A lot of the money from this is going towards our cash reserves. If we're successful in our endeavors, we're trying to build up our cash reserves for the future to sustain the cemetery. Cedar Grove Cemetery is very unique. If some of you, I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, but if you looked at a lot of other cemeteries, uh, they're mostly, they tend to be flat. They also tend to not to have a lot of trees and, and grass. Cedar Grove is a very expensive cemetery to maintain because we have so many trees and because we have so many hills and because we put so much effort into the green space and keeping it available to the public. We've recently added a second koi pond. We continue to try to appeal so people feel comfortable not only visiting their loved ones, but taking the children for a walk 
in the cemetery and enjoying the beauty of the flowers and the trees. With the help of uh, CPA, we've planted over 100 trees in the cemetery in the last few years, actually three years to be more precise. If some of you have been through the cemetery in recent years, you'll see there are a lot of trees that are, that are in tough shape that are gonna need to come down over the next few years uh, because they're becoming hazardous. And that is part of our path too. Uh, when a tree comes down, we're looking to replace it. Uh, some of these trees are very old. I'm sure some of you have walked through there and seen a lot of them with a lot of broken branches and some rot. We've also removed probably 50 of these trees in the last few years as we build for the future. So that's the overall of how we got there, where we're trying to go, and how we feel about it and how we feel about the community. I've spent 30 years of my working life in Dorchester. Uh, I am still actively involved in the cemetery. I'm on site at least once a week uh, and often more. I still do the books for the cemetery. I still do the long range planning. Um, and I feel this is a good thing, long range for Cedar Grove Cemetery and the history of Cedar Grove Cemetery. With the things we've been allowed to do so far, we're banking the land and future sites. We right now came from a potential inventory of less than 200 units. We've got the ability right now uh, for over a thousand units. We only sell on average 150 per year. So as we build to the future, uh, we're trying to accumulate some funds in a cushion because there'll come a day where the cemetery will be down to just having perhaps no lots for sale, but just maintaining it and maintaining it for the future of the people that are buried there and for loved ones to join them. As most of the sites accommodate more than one individual and they also accommodate um, uh, ashes uh, within that. So there's still plenty of room, even when we're out of sites, but we're hoping with some other land that we already have that we're developing a little bit at a time because funds are very tight. We're hoping to get that number up to in excess of $2,000, in excess of 2,000 units over the next few years. So I hope I've given you an overview of the plans. And if there's anything I can possibly answer for you, I would certainly welcome that opportunity. So please feel free. Anything I can help with, I, I really want to do that. Please. Yeah. Thank you, Anthony. That's great. Um, I, I'm sure that the commissioners, there may be some questions, although before we maybe get to that, um, I just want to acknowledge that uh, Dave Marr is on and present on the call. And also um, Ted Schwartzberg from the planning department would like to make a few comments. Thank you, Commissioner, uh, or Chair and uh, Commissioners. Um, my name is Ted Schwartzberg. I'm the Assistant Deputy Director for Planning Review at the Planning Department. And I prepared a single slide uh, to have up on the screen while I'm talking. Great, thank you. Uh, so thank you for having me. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm uh, Assistant Deputy Director for Planning Review at the Planning Department, and I'm here to provide uh, staff commentary on this petition. And uh, I want to note that this is a little different than when uh, the commissioners typically see uh, Planning Department staff at their hearings. Uh, typically, uh, staff will present a petition on behalf of our department uh, and that's something that uh, goes to our board first and then the planning department board uh, approves a petition and then staff present it uh, for example a pda uh, as as the planning department's petition uh, in this instance uh, my presentation and my comments uh, have not been reviewed by my board uh, because i am giving comments on a petition that has originated from this proponent uh, who just presented. So this is not a planning department petition. Uh, this is just commentary on uh, the member of the public and property owner who is, has presented a petition. Uh, on this petition, um, I prepared a single slide showing the location uh, on the map on the left. And so the, the red star is the approximate location of 97 Milton Street. Uh, and then the image on the right shows the current condition, which, as the proponent mentioned, is a single family home. Uh, after reviewing this petition, 
planning department staff have concluded that this request is appropriate. Uh, and our reasoning for uh, uh, finding that this petition is appropriate is uh, twofold. One, uh, as indicated by the map on the left, uh, this would be a contiguous uh, zoning subdistrict where the 1F 5000 district that's on the other side of Milton Street uh, would simply be extended across the street into this parcel. And uh, because it's an expansion that's contiguous of an existing subdistrict, we find that the mapping is appropriate. And then the second and final reason is that the uh, existing use and occupancy uh, is consistent with that zoning. So I wanna highlight uh, a final point uh, that uh, you'll see the image on the right in my slide is different than the rendering that the proponent had up during their pr presentation. And that's because the planning department staff finding is based on the narrow uh, comparison of what the petition is uh, for single family zoning and the current use uh, single family. Uh, I am not making comments on a potential six unit project that has uh, that's outside the scope of today's petition, and that's not something that's been reviewed by staff. Uh, so I want to clarify in my final comment that uh, the, the staff recommendation that the uh, petition is appropriate is based on the understanding that uh, this is to zone a parcel that has a single family home on it for single family zoning. And that concludes my remarks. And thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Ted. Um, do any of the commissioners have any uh, questions for the presenters or Ted? I think we can take down Ted's uh, slide as well. Thanks. I do, Jill. Um, the uh, as uh, as Ted indicated, this is this will now be a contiguous uh, uh, one F uh, five uh, one a single family zone. Um, so I'm assuming that's why the um, the proponent is saying that they will need to go to the um, uh, to the ZBA uh, for approval of uh, uh, three to, uh, two family units. Or is that correct, Anthony? I'm asking this of the of the uh, proponent, Anthony or um, or yeah. Charles, do you want to comment on that question? Yeah. From a legality point of view, Charlie is certainly stronger in that area than me. Uh, that is my general understanding, but I don't want to misspeak. Charlie, you still you available to? You're on mute, Charlie. It is my it is my You're understanding. Muted. It is my understanding that we would need further approval to continue. That is my general understanding. I agree with your comment, though, sir. And I think Charlie, if I recall in your remarks, you you had said that that this is the request is to zone the single family because that's there, and that there would be community outreach as well as a ZBA process if you do proceed with the um, the other activity. So, I I think you had mentioned that in your comments, but you're on mute, so we can't hear you. That, that is that is my understanding. You know, we, we've discussed this before, and that is my understanding. Uh, Madam Chair, that is correct. Um, your assessment. I apologize. I had difficulty unmuting. Well, thank you. Does that answer the question, Drew? It does. I mean, it's unfortunate that they can't just zone it for what it's what they're planning on on doing. But I and it would be spot zoning to just have a um, the appropriate the the zone for what they want. Um, okay, that's for that's a decision for another day. Appreciate the kind words. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the commissioners? All right. At this point, um, I would call for public testimony. And if there is anyone that would like to testify either uh, in support or opposition, to please um, let staff know by raising your hand. And once you are um, able to be unmuted, and present, please announce your name, affiliation, and your position for the proposed project. Jeff, are there any? Uh, yeah, we'll start with uh, Mark Joseph. Mark, go ahead. Sure, yeah. Uh, good morning. 
Uh, the question I have, I know of the zoning, they try to make it contiguous to the adjacent uh, zoning sub-district. Uh, with respect to dimensional requirements, if it's one at 5,000 and you have a two family there, would there be additional uh, lot required uh, for the second unit? Or oh, the one at 5,000 will be also the same for the two family? Um, I, I suppose that the uh, the staff could comment, but we're we're really just asking for public testimony either in support or opposition um, for the presenter. Well, sure, yeah, I'm in support of this. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Is are there any other? Um... Yep. Uh, John O'Toole. John, go ahead and unmute yourself. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, my name is John O'Toole and um, I have, uh, I'm also a trustee of Cedar Grove Cemetery, but I'm also uh, an abutter. My mom lives across the street at 84 Milton Street and uh, I was past president of Cedar Grove Cemetery for 16 years. Um, I'd like to speak in support of, of this uh, zoning change and uh, hopefully potentially for the, uh, the zoning for the, the multifamilies as well. Um, there's a vacant building on the property only currently. There's been a lot of thought into the design of this project as well, so it would be compatible with the uh, other homes in the neighborhood. It will serve to increase housing in the city of Boston, which is so desperately needed. And um, just wanted to voice my support for this uh, project. Thank you. Thank you, John. Jeff, are there raised hands, Madam Chair. No more? Okay. Thank you. Um, at this time, uh, we will go into a business session. And um, although do uh, uh, Charlie and um, I, you don't need any time for rebuttal because I don't think there was any um, opposition. So at this point, we'll go into a business session and I would ask um, uh, for the commissioner's uh, to ask any questions or any, make any comments, and if appropriate, to, um, uh, I would ask for a motion to adopt uh, this proposal. Um, so um, <clears throat> I I am actually uh, really sensitive and and um, supportive of this. I'm I'm probably the commissioner who has spent most of his career. Uh, working with cemeteries such as Cedar Grove, so I am um, uh, I'm a subject matter expert in cemeteries, uh, believe it or not, and so I am very very sympathetic to the challenges that um, you know Anthony and Charlie face in trying to kind of uh, maintain a, a urban landscape that has very important emotional and cultural value while also trying to support kind of the care of these kinds of places. They're very special places and they need our care and support. So um, I make a motion to um, support um, this petition. Thank you, Ricardo. Is second. there, thank you. Thank you for the second. Um, is there any other discussion? If not, we'll go to a roll call vote. Um, Mr. Nichols? Yes. Ms. Morikawa? Yes. Mr. Marr? Yes. Ms. Miller? Yes. Mr. Luff? Yes. Mr. Arroyo? Yes. Mr. Ostrich? Yes. And myself, I vote yes. Um, the, uh, the item uh, passes unanimously. Uh, at this time, we are going to remain in our business session and staff is going to provide an informational presentation on the draft skyline zoning for downtown. This is not a zone, this is not a voting item. And I just want to um, remind the public that they're welcome to stay and listen to this presentation and it will be recorded. This informational session will also be part of the recording of our hearing and available um, on the website. And so at this time, I'll turn the floor over to, I believe, Kathleen and your team for the presentation on the draft skyline. Thanks, uh, Chair, and thank you, Commissioners, uh, for your support. And thank you to Jeff Hampton as well. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, 
thank everybody for their time and their courtesy. I greatly appreciate it. I will be dropping off because I'm actually in work. So, but thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Great. And um, Joanne, I believe Andrew Namias, uh, who's a, a senior urban designer at the um, planning department, uh, needs screen share capability in order to uh, share the presentation. So if we can just make him uh, a co-host. Um, Andrew um, had uh, been leading over uh, the last couple of years since the uh, pick back up of plan downtown after the pandemic. Um, our efforts uh, across plan downtown, both to complete the neighborhood plan itself and the additional office to residential conversion study uh, that was part of plan downtown. Uh, and then now has also led um, the drafting of the skyline districts of zoning, uh, as well as how they would be applied across the area in order to implement plan downtown. And so, Andrew, I think you also have sharing privileges now uh, to be able to. I do. Perfect. Um, well, uh, thank you all uh, for giving us the opportunity to um, give an update on this process so far. Uh, as Kathleen mentioned, this um, is part of um, a very long process, planning process um, involving downtown uh, that dates back to 2018 when Plan Downtown was first initiated. Um, uh, through the planning Plan Downtown process um, and is now um, has since now led to um, uh, the zoning process of introducing new um, districts and um, uh, uh, zoning for the downtown area. Um, so um, we'll take you through one a bit of an update of of you know the process so far, um, and then walk walk through some of uh, uh, the elements of um, this new skyline district that would be a part of a new article. 31, um, which includes um, incorporating um, a lot of the uh, land use modernization process that has been um, enacted so far um, and applied to the downtown process as part of this, um, uh, introducing new forum regulations um, and also ensuring that we're encouraging adaptive reuse um, that aligns with the office conversion, uh, office to residential conversion program. Um, as well as creating pathways for um, existing conditional uses to um, expand. Um, this will also uh, involve um, creating new zone zoning boundaries to downtown um, that will map uh, these new districts to the area. Um, so, so again, this is part of a, a long process that dates back to 2018 with Plan Downtown that was looking at ways in which to um, encourage the growth of the area, as well as preserve um, the rich historic fabric um, of downtown um, and you know, open up opportunities for housing, a greater mix of uses beyond just kind of the commercial concentration of uses there, um, as well as to improve things like open space and um, sustainability uh, and affordability in the area. Um, that, coincided, that process coincided with the office to residential conversion study that led to um, the office to residential conversion program um, that was uh, launched last year. Um, part of the process also uh, resulted in design guidelines for the area um, and has since uh, also started a historic character study looking at ways in which we could have design guidelines that complement zoning and ensure that uh, projects um, uh, can help can navigate the historic fabric of the area um, and have also direction as to how um, you know, the zoning envelope can be better refined um, through uh, the design review process. Um, and that leads us to really this zoning process that um, you know, is, was very much ingrained in the plant downtown process so far. Um, uh, in which we uh, recently, uh, well, early in this year, released a draft zoning te text amendment related to those goals uh, back in, in uh, April, early April. Um, and part of the public engagement for the zoning process involved um, community meetings, surveys, um, as well as an eight week public comment period for that draft. Um, and we're currently in the process of um, still you know, refi refining the draft itself 
um, as well as the boundaries of the zoning districts. So the um, now kind of diving into um, these new uh, districts, um, what we're introducing um, and proposing is uh, something called the new skyline district. Um, the, these districts that are really meant to enable job growth, um, new housing, uh, entertainment uses, as well as um, uh, key destinations and cult cultural destinations um, alongside uh, a wide range of mixed uses. Um, while at the same time encouraging and ensuring um, the preservation of historic areas as part of that. Um, and the district itself um, is divided into two sub-districts. Uh, the Sky District is really ca categorized by um, the dense accumulation of um, uh, job centers, housing, um, uh, centered around uh, major transportation assets. Um, these areas that really have a long history as, of, of being, um, you know, centers of the city. Um, and alongside that are the, um, uh, is a proposed sky low district, um, which are areas that um, still have kind of that uh, key components of, um, you know, the urban core and downtown context, but um, are areas that have key uh, cohesive historic buildings um, dating back to prior areas of downtown. Um, and it's in this district that um, we would be using historic overlays to set smaller uh, form regulations that uh, better fit the scale of the area to ensure that we're maintaining the fine grained um, and historic uh, uh, scale of that zone. So when looking at um, what we want to both advance through uh, this zoning reform process, um, as well as maintain. Um, we're really looking to apply uh, this, the modernization of uses that we've been uh, working through as part of the squares and streets process and other zoning initiatives um, to um, these downtown uh, skyline contexts and downtown itself. Um, we do also wanna introduce new form based, uh, a new form based zoning approach um, focusing on uh, encouraging ground floor uses, um, also ensuring that buildings respond and uh, to respond and uh, align with the scale of the context. Um, in downtown, um, especially, um, we want to ensure that we uh, pr um, uh, uh, include protections on theater structures. Um, uh, moving what some of those protections that exist in the Midtown Cultural District uh, article into Article 85. Um, we also wanna preserve key mitigation pro uh, policies. So that includes um, IDP um, as well as linkage um, for large scale projects. Uh, we also want to eliminate um, PD PDA eligible areas within downtown um, and this is to really ensure that there's um, more predictability um, in, in the development process in the area. Um, and at the same time, um, acknowledge that we are trying to open up um, uh, uh, more density um, and development pathways um, uh, to update zoning itself, uh, outdated zoning in, in the area. Um, some of the key things that we're maintaining are the functions of our Article 80 review process, um, uh, include things like environmental impact analysis um, and analyzing uh, performance standards for wind, um, which are you know, key things uh, when looking at large scale development in the downtown context, um, as well as looking at uh, ensuring that we're maintaining green building regulations, demolition review, um, inclusionary zoning, as well as uh, overlays that are in place downtown, including um, uh, GCOD as well as uh, C fraud in the area. Can I just ask a quick question, Andrew, on the PDA? Um, yes, point, please. There aren't many PDA eligible areas in downtown. Are there maybe five or six? So there are. Now I'm going to blank on the number. That's okay. But, but it, it's not. A, um, it's not a, a massive number, correct? There are some key um, eligible areas that have uh, PDAs already enacted and standing. Okay. Um, so we don't see within uh, those areas um, new PDAs um, forming. 
Um, and that that's also like one impetus of uh, eliminating the eligible areas themselves. Um, we will be keeping, uh, you know, we're proposing keeping the PDAs that um, exist in place. Um, it's just the eligible zones that those, we yeah, propose. Yeah, those, those few that we had. I remember when we made them eligible, but it, so but it, but someone could come in and tr and and suggest a PDA and go through a process uh, in the future, right? It's not a forbidden. Um, so, uh, the elimination of the eligible areas would forbid future PDAs, um, in this area, the specific <laughs> text does include, um, a limit on the, uh, scale of amendment of an existing PDA, uh, so that, uh, um, and I, I think, Andrew, I think it's 15 feet that we said uh in height that you're uh, allowed to access um yes the substantial amending a PDA. Court. and that is of a goal that we're and again i i think this is unlikely in the immediate term but we're a portion of a project that uh was approved and developed through a pda uh to come in for redevelopment uh in the future we would want them to redevelop under this updated zoning uh not by amending the pda Okay. Uh, itself. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so please uh, um, chime in for questions as I try and run through this a lot of content. <laughs> um, but uh, when it comes to the Skyline districts, and this is across both uh, the Sky and Sky Low, um, we're really looking at trying to maximize res residential growth. Um, while still recognizing the fact that um, areas like downtown, we wanna maintain uh, these areas as job centers, but um, in so far kind of also introduce uh, more, more mixed use. Um, so residential is allowed across both districts, um, uh, large office and hotel. So that's over 50,000 square feet are conditional, um, but this is really to ensure that they're properly evaluated as um, under linkage um uh so that we are still um you know uh maintaining mitigation from projects at that scale um lab uses are forbidden in skylo and part of that is to um you know align with some of the historic scale of those areas while they're conditional in sky district um and again um eliminating pda eligible areas across um both uh zones Um, so as I mentioned, we're really trying to um, carry through with a lot of the uh, modern land use modernization work that's been done so far um, alongside the squares and streets process um, earlier uh, uh, this year. Um, uh, and looking at ways in which we can um, streamline uh, land use definitions and groupings. Um, to ensure that we're reducing barriers in areas, um, especially within areas like downtown um, that have you know, struggled through the pandemic, but are um, really emerging as uh, you know, key opportunities for different diverse businesses to emerge. Um, so this process included looking at, again, looking at size thresholds, um, form and performance standards for different uses, um, ensuring that uh, Definitions were clear, transparent, aligned with policy goals, um, as well as working with that ISD to ensure that inter interpretation is clear um, and across looking at across different city departments. And I think this is a lot of information that um, you know, you've seen uh, that we're now trying to apply to these districts and downtown. Um, in downtown specifically, there's um, uh, it, within Midtown Cultural District it's, uh, in particular, there's a wide range of allowed uses, um, but a lot of restrictions on ground floor uses themselves. And so this includes things like yoga studios, um, which are forbidden. Um, and a lot of these uses are, are really simply outdated, looking at things like specifying uses like millinery shops and lamp shops, um, but uh, not including the flexibility for things like a gym or escape room or a yoga studio. Um, one other key thing that we're, we see um, across uh, many areas downtown in terms of uses is takeout being conditional, which would effectively make things like um, an ice cream shop 
uh, being a conditional use downtown. And so this is again a look at how um, you're we're trying to uh, align um, uh, kind of some of those outdated groupings um, uh, and a, a definition of uses um, with the you know new use table in Article Eight. Um, so these are some of the specific uses in things, areas like the Midtown Cultural District that um, we're aligning now with um, our new use definitions. Part of this too, though, is is looking uh, to ensure can I just that. Just for one second, Andrew. I'm just a little sure. bit confused. The I was make sure I understand this chart. So the ones on the left are what's current, and the ones on the right are what's going to be allowed in the future. Is that exactly? So okay. So right. like uh, the takeout ice cream. I'm sitting here scratching my head. Why are we against that? What you're saying is that it will be allowed in the future. Exactly. Yeah. We, so we also have to... asked that question of why are we against <laughs> ice cream and coffee shops downtown? Uh, right. And the advantage of uh, the modernized Article 8 uh, okay. use table that we brought forward to you is that we're working off of one use table now for uh, all districts that can be left up to date. And it makes these key moves like allowing those uses. And, and can I just, I, I, I uh, hit my. Um... Uh, myself on mute, so I didn't get to ask this question. Again, the PDAs. So um, uh, we're trying to make sure that this is an area where you can have density and do something that's um, bigger than many other areas in town. So why is it that we're getting rid of the PDA? Is everything that's in a PDA that if I were going to go in currently in a PDA, it'll now be as a right Correct. Uh, or, you know, you may need to go to the Board of Appeal for conditional approval of a conditional use permit. Um, so there are, I'd say, three major reasons behind that. Um, one of them is is fundamentally that PDAs need to be an acre of land. And there are, particularly as we think about what um, redevelopment of some of these sites look like downtown, they mm -hmm. are unlikely to be an acre of land. Uh, uh -huh. And so relying on PDA eligibility as a tool um, really limits that uh, and particularly limits the ability to make sure we're writing rules that can work for density at, at smaller floor plates and finer grain. Um, the second thing is that it is very difficult for us to maintain uh, kind of PDAs over time uh, because they really do become their own zoning so, yeah. code for that parcel. Uh, so, they are very effective at uh, writing that plan of development, uh, but because they don't apply, they're not like a special permit that applies to the project, they're applying to the land. Uh, we, over time, and we've seen this in downtown where we have older PDAs, um, end up in situation, the same sort of problem of lamp shops or not anticipating you know, yoga studios or escape rooms uh, or microbreweries are things that happen in our PDAs. Um, we had a PDA come in last week that we were going to have to bring forward for amendment to allow a daycare to have kindergarten classes uh, because they explicitly wrote it as pre-K, like not including kindergarten when they wrote that PDA back in um, you know, the early 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we think it as part of a commitment to having the zoning be able to be maintained over time and particularly the importance of retenanting of spaces and a sort of vitality of new uses downtown. Um, that's something where we see that the PDAs are a, a sort of maintenance problem for us long term sure. in mixed use contexts. I appreciate that um, as long as, as we're still trying to get the uh, the density in a different uh, different way. The one other thing that you said that it concerned me a little bit though is that they can go to the CBA. I mean, I we having looked at this in the past, there's like what a thousand <laughs> projects going to the CBA more here in Boston than any place else. Um, and I thought we were trying to reduce that. So we are definitely trying to reduce people going to the CBA for variances. Mm -hmm. um, we think the issue of a conditional use oh, permit okay. yeah, feel, okay. is a, a proper use of the ZBA, particularly okay. for the, those cases where it, it really may depend on 
yeah. um, the operation of the use in a, a downtown context to, yeah. to make sense. That, that makes sense to me. Thank you. One last question. I don't know if this is the right place to ask it or not. I live in the leather district, so this is all very important to me. Why is the leather district and uh, Bay Village, why haven't they been included in this planning? I mean, are we going to be by ourselves? We're going to do one leather district plan and one Bay Village plan? I just I don't, think, I don't understand why we weren't included in this downtown. We seem to be very similar to the to the latter blocks. I I think that's a a, a good series of questions. I think um, I mean neither Andrew or I can can really speak to the the decisions in twenty eighteen uh, around the boundaries of planned. Well, actually. Some of the boundaries of plan downtown were closely correlated with state requirements uh, for us to conduct a plan looking at impacts of updated state shadow law um, and particularly the approval of the Winthrop Tower development. So because of the state requirement that we conduct a planning effort focused on downtown and areas impacted by that, that really drove a lot of the effort of that boundary. Our goal in creating these districts, um, and particularly some of the work that uh, Andrew has done in um, thinking through Sky Low and how it could be modified to fit different types of air, like areas where we have different scales of historic building pattern, uh, is that these are districts that could be provide like could be mapped more broadly across downtown like uh, areas of the city. Um, so I. I think we are not proposing to bring that remapping now because of the the sort of limits of the uh, plan downtown planning process, but we do see these districts as something that uh, long term could be applied to uh, a leather district uh, or other areas of the city that where they were appropriate. We'll likely in the leather district, we'll likely have our own plan that will uh, and zoning. I I think we also point. right as a as we continue to think about like zoning and planning um, and as the city is doing more comprehensive planning, uh, we're very aware that we can't do five to six year long planning processes uh, mm -hmm. to get to updated zoning. Uh, and so there may be places, particularly where we're affirming existing sort of character um, and sort of uses and scale of building where we look to do sort of design studies and rezoning processes that are not a, a full fledged um, comprehensive planning effort. Okay. Thank you. But but to clarify though, just like the use table, the new use table, that would apply to places like Bay Village and the Leather District. It um it doesn't right now because uh we well, essentially but, are building a code within a code, but long term, yes. Long term it would. Yes. Yeah. Um, our goal is that all updated districts that we bring to you as a zoning commission uh, use that use table, that we add things right as needed to that use table so that ultimately uh, everyone is operating for, and we can maintain all of those questions of uses in one location of the code. So kind of getting back, Kathleen, to the daycare center, wanting to add a kindergarten, um, are those types of uh, modernization um, elements uh, expected to be in the new uses under the new Article Eight, um, so that in even it's even though the PDA had a pre-K kind of dialed into its program, it would then default to this more comprehensive use table, which would allow it without it needing to go to the ZBA. Is that is that your? So, is that what I take away? Unfortunately, most. PDAs um, and and some this was very strategic at the uh, time, particularly in areas where PDAs were applied under um, underlying industrial zoning, have clauses that say that they uh, are only the uses enumerated and don't allow any uses otherwise allowed in underlying zoning uh, unless listed there. Uh, so, in that situation and and for that PDA uh, specifically, it that meant that it. It, in fact, uh, PDAs don't benefit from updating we're doing to underlying zoning because they've explicitly uh, set themselves off. Uh, there are PDAs across the city that uh, have a different like clause that says they, they do uh, compose with underlying zoning. Um, one of the challenges of this uh, approach um, is we're proud of the modernization. It We are not going in and changing 
existing zoning districts across the state. We do something like this where we're comprehensive. Okay, thank you. I think Kathleen, did we might have lost your bit your audio. Can you hear me? I, no. We can hear you, Andrew. I, oh, I'm okay. sorry. We sort yeah, we of did um, lose Kathleen's. Yeah, we um, yeah. Did you want Kathleen to to reiterate? No, I'll, I'll, or, or, I'll continue. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Andrew, because I know we sort of sidetracked you there, but oh but no, that, I am, I, are am I back questions. now? Yes. yes. Back, Kathleen. Okay. I don't thank know you. what's going on with my. I'm going to run an update on my whole computer. I think after this meeting, <laughs> um, I'm not sure where I uh, jumped out, but more broadly, the the updated use table. We are essentially building an updated code within the current code. Uh, and so places are benefiting from the updated code uh, when we map them with an updated district, um, rather than our going in and making existing districts uh, subject to the new use table. So Kathleen, on that, on that same point though, do you, do you all anticipate on relatively small PDA changes that, that will sort of, um, you know, you said no amendments to PDAs going forward, but if somebody needs a relatively small change, that the implications are broader and, and you know, brings in sort of a whole suite of other um, impacts from the, uh, the, the transition to the new downtown zoning. How do you anticipate handling relatively minor PDA modifications? I, I think, uh... If we think that is something that amounts to sort of a certificate of consistency, then um, that's the the type of thing that we envision continuing to occur under the existing uh, PDA. Um, I guess having not having directly the, the, all the PDAs in front of me, I'm I'm unsure of the specific uh, language that's in each one, um, but. Uh, in adopting this underlying zoning, we're setting a clear uh, sense of of the mix of uses and the types of uses that we want to see in the area that would clearly be clear kind of planning and, and zoning context for any amendment, um, where we are uh, pretty explicitly limiting amendments um, is that if someone were to uh, break apart a component of their PDA, look to redevelop right, part of an existing PDA with a new tower, for example, um, that scale of redevelopment is something that we want to, uh, ideally, um, right, and again, the property owner is always going to have the rights and the um, all that they have under their existing PDA and be able to make their own decision. We want to make sure they have a pathway under um, this updated zoning to do that rather than relying on a, a successive series of PDA amendments. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll uh, dive into some more. Um, uh, so part of the Article 8 um, uh, modernization of, of uses, part of that was creating this ca category of active uses, um, a grouping of um, uh, uses that we see, especially on the ground floor, um, as ones that uh, can activate the streetscape, um, uh, create kind of a um, uh, more activity in the area. Um, and when how this comes into play in Skyline is that the Sky and Sky Low set different requirements for um, how much active use um, needs to be on the ground floor, um, the width and the depth of active uses um, on the uh, primary frontage. Uh, so that fu future projects um, uh, or projects within the district um, uh, we're ensuring that uh, ground floors of ones that, in the case of Skyline, parcels that are on the larger side, um, at the very least, include um, uses like these to activate the area. One question on this, Andrew. Uh, why are civic uses uh, in particular exempted 
And, um, and I guess I would say uh, same for affordable housing, though there may be special rules on that. I mean, why, why don't we, if you have a civic use, like a, a office building, I, I developed this uh, for the, was the project manager for the state of transportation building many, many years ago. We put retail on the ground floor, make it a more human kind of place. Why do, why civic uses have to be exempted? So, um, when there's a couple of answers to that, uh, in the, the example of the state, uh, there is the reality that they're not subject to our authority yeah. on zoning. Uh, so while we deeply uh, appreciate the work that happened there to make that a good urban building, um, there is that component. We also have a number of civic uses like uh, right, schools, police stations, fire stations uh, that have uh, um, courthouses. Uh, that have sort of specific programmatic uh, requirements that um, preclude having a, an active use. Um, so I, we thought it's appropriate that that use category overall is exempted from this requirement, even as both our state and our city government have worked hard to yeah. bring this in, uh, active uses into some of their facilities where appropriate to, to get this. So those active uses could be provided if the if the city said, okay, this exactly. building, can there's no it. way prohibited. But it's We're not just being saying... prohibited. It's just that they, I understand the fire station would be. You know, exactly. Uh, and, you know, a library yeah. is a very active use in and of itself, but it, it oh. will show up as a civic use uh, in the category. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, open space, uh, you know, I think uh, similarly, right, the, the parks the, uh, themselves or those open spaces sure. themselves might be doing something different. Uh, for both shelter facilities and affordable housing developments, um, their ability to provide this uh, really uh, depends on, um, in downtown, particularly the, the scale of the building that they're going into and sometimes the some privacy needs that they need for tenants uh, in terms of shelter facilities and funding requirements. Um, in their development. We heard pretty strongly from affordable housing developers as we were uh, drafting this that they frequently um, are, because the commercial space they may have in a ground floor is really not part of the, the financing of a low-income housing tax credit project. Mm -hmm. uh, the same way that while they want to provide that space, they're very hesitant to to be even sort of further limited on the number, the type of tenants that can go in it. Um, and so we thought appropriate given the sort of overwhelming need for this type of housing in the city. Um, and uh, the fact that through both BPDA review and with the mayor's out office of housing, they get a, a very targeted and very um, intense like levels of design and civic review to really make sure it's maximizing all the things that you know, we like active uses to do in a, a context um, that it's appropriate to not have them be subject to this zoning requirement. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And, and how do how do IMPs, um, you know, like Suffolk, having you know some property within the um, boundaries, are they exempted from this too? Would that be a civic use? A, you know, you know, someone that does an institutional master plan. The institutional master plan itself uh, functions as an overlay, very much like a, a PDA does. Um, so um, in the area of downtown where we do have active IMPs, uh, we are proposing to update them to this base uh, underlying zoning, um, particularly as some of those institutions uh, are doing more and more projects that are joint development or involve them leasing space. Uh, we, we think that in downtown particularly appropriate that they be subject to the same rules, um, but the IMP can then set standards exempting specific institutional uses as part of its IMP approval. I think it did. Okay, so, so we, we maintain the IMP process and just they just become subject to this and need to opt out if they can prove and demonstrate mm -hmm. that it it might not work in a particular building if it's okay. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Kathleen, I have a question here with respect to the PDA here, because this is very interesting here at ISD here, since we see that a lot. If they're trying to redevelop a piece of land within a PDA, even though if the uses exist on that PDA, we have to send them back to you. Uh, maybe you might approve, you might not approve that. I, 
think it really depends on the P PDA um, because I, I've seen PDAs where uh, that that won't be an issue and and ones where it, it has. Um, and again, I, I think as part of why when we think to the future of a tool downtown, particularly for you know areas that aren't an acre, we're we're trying to make sure we're not over relying on PDAs uh, as a tool. Yes, I mean I'm talking mainly about the existing ones. So where often so we see people come here within a PDA, they come with the listing of allow use there, and then they want to swap one for another. By doing that swapping procedure, that would be fine with the the known regulations there. Is that correct? These updates to zoning won't change anything around what the individual PDA and whether that uh, swapping is either allowed within the terms of the PDA or whether they need to amend the PDA to allow open retenanting with other allowed uses. Um, some PDAs will need to amend their PDA in order to allow them to do it. Uh, others uh, have it reference allowed uses and underlying zoning. Okay, thank you. I think one other element to note here is that um, uh, I think as as Kathleen mentioned, uh, we're not prohibiting active uses in this case. It, this is kind of this other level of um, you know, opportunity to ensure we're getting uses on the ground floor. Um, at the same time, we don't want to create another barrier for like smaller sites, for example. Um, uh, in some ways, simply we see updating the uses, uh, creating things like ice cream shops um, as allowed. Um, that's kind of the first step in, in creative active ground floors. Um, this is really meant for, uh, I think, large sites to ensure that um, uh, uh, projects with long frontages, especially in the case of downtown, are including some of these things. Um, and I, I think we, we want to make sure we're not saying things like, well, if this requirement is in place for these sites, then they don't have to be active per se. Um, I, this is just kind of a fail safe to ensure that um, uh, large projects are really including this. This also pairs with another requirement, um, the blank wall limitation um, that puts a max on a, a blank wall of facade. So something, a facade that doesn't have um, uh, entryways or windows um, and that at least opens the door to, um, you know, things like windows and like uh, uh, lobby spaces. Um, those are also ways to um, activate uh, the street as well. Um, but uh, at the same time, ensure we're not getting long blank facades um, in these areas. Well, on these active uses, uh, Andrew, uh, there have uses that are straightforward, but there are some that are not straightforward. And when we go to the definition on Article 2, would we be able to find what we can say makerspace uh, service establishment? We know what type of activities will be within those two uses because some of them are not described on Article 2. Uh, so these are all referencing the updated uses in Article 8. And Mark, you were such a huge help in helping, uh, particularly Maya, uh, draft those. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for anyone on the public who doesn't know, Mark Joseph is really our secret weapon uh, ah. at ISD and making sure that we have zoning that really works at every part of the process. You know, the one thing about these these active uses that, you know, I can think about from a from a feasibility point of view, places like a grocery store, you know, a small grocery store probably can afford the rent at street level, but a typical grocery store like a star market would want to go downstairs. Um, you know, I just there's some some it'll be interesting to see how this plays out, I guess, because I think there are some just economic components that it. You, you may have to, it may need a little tweaking over time, you know, because we do want grocery stores in downtown. I think that would be great, but they may have to go into a lower level. Which And I, um, so we, I think that's a, a really great point. And part of what uh, Andrew has 
uh, done is set like um, rather than this being like an entire ground floor, it's uh, a, a pretty limited set of square footage um, that also reflects things like the uh, Roche Brothers that I went to in downtown Crossing on my way home from City Hall last night uh, or the North Station Star Market. Both have a, a section above ground, right? And then you sort of go down into the more supermarket experience and that's uh, below ground too. Yeah. So, so along, along these lines, can you, could for a grocery store or a, or a re, um, major retail shop that's like a, you know, mini department store or something, could they be on the upper levels on, on level two and level three as well? I mean, we, in many cities that we have that. Yes. Yeah. And that from a, just a use allowances, uh, this yeah. creates a lot, the, the proposed use table for these districts allow them lots of places, uh, this was primarily a, um, as we thought about, like really large, like essentially block long stretches mm -hmm. of, of building face, uh, making sure that we're getting some yeah. level of activity on a, a, a whole block. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So these can, of course, occur yeah. over different floors. This is really just saying, well, you have a large frontage, a certain percentage of this has to be one of these um, to help. Uh, activate the space alongside also not having a really long blank wall. Uh, so something that also aligns with this um, and the work that was part of use modernization was um, looking at um, scales of different uses um, to ensure that uh, we're really um, applying the proper use sizes to different zones. Um, this comes into play uh, when we're looking at these two two different districts, sky low and sky, um, as well as you know looking at ensuring that we're maintaining things like um, linkage uh, that is triggered at the the fifty thousand square foot scale, um, uh, so that's that's what you begin to see in the proposed use tables where um, there's the flexibility of uh, in this case the retail size across these two districts, but. Um, the extra large uh, retail size um, is conditional um, to maintain linkage in the area. Um, and when it comes to entertainment uses, um, however, that's that's also where we, uh, as part of um, updating the the use definitions and and table, um, uh, divided started to classify the different size of possible entertainment use use spaces. Um, and what's appropriate for across these two different districts. Um, so it's really at the entertainment large scale um, that we're looking at uh, something like the Boston Opera House, um, which is uh, 2,600 capacity. Um, that becomes something that's conditional in sky low um, where we're looking at uh, you know finer grain, smaller buildings. Um, and something like an extra large entertainment space, uh, which goes up to the size of TD Garden, um, is forbidden in, in the sky low context. So some of the things um, that aligns with a bit of the, you know, activating ground floor discussion um, also looks at um, things that we want to build in related to uh, breaking down large blocks, ensuring that um, smaller parcels are uh, aren't assembled into large blocks as well, um, and in ways in which we can create um, additional uh, uh, ground floor pu public realm space, especially in the downtown context where um, some sidewalks become very narrow. Um, so looking for as many opportunities as possible to create that um, through something uh, like a new requirement, which is a ground floor outdoor amenity space um, requirement for, again, um, those larger block parcels um, that would require additional uh, public space on the ground floor along the primary facade. Um, and then addition to that, in addition to that is then the uh, limit on blank wall. Andrew, can you sp uh, speak to the first bullet there a little more, the, the reduced large blocks? I mean, it, it probably stands to reason that in the Skyline District, you're going to have some pretty big projects, pretty big um is that like at a significantly different scale than than what is typical kind of existing in that district today? That really comes into play for Sky Low, um, 
because in Skylo, we're setting a um, a maximum parcel size of uh, our maximum floor plate size of um, 25,000 square feet, which um, is kind of the medium um, uh, average of those parcels in the area, um, kind of the max size that we see. Um, so that would really just ensure that in Skylo, where there's the co more cohesive scale of parcels and building floor plates, um, that there's not the risk of combining those smaller parcels to create um, larger blocks in, in that context. Um, the other element that's part of that too is um, uh, in ensuring we continue some of the change of use uh, restrictions that we have on theater structures. Um, that was really specific to the Midtown Cultural District um, and the process that came out of um, the plan there, um, pinpointing some of the key theaters downtown um, and ensuring that the ones that are uh, used today as theaters um, uh, require additional review um, uh, in the case of any you know, attempt of change of use. Um, there's also for downtown, there's um, uh, not a threshold for us uh, for um, uh, design review itself at the small scale. Um, so this would be in introducing as part of these districts a uh, 20,000 square foot um, threshold for design review. The other form-based elements that we want to introduce here, um, one, like the sky uh, district especially, in which the, the height limit for that uh, area is um, uh, FAA regulations, um, as well as um, a state law shadow regulations. Um, so in, in that case, there's a lot of flexibility when it comes to height, um, but we still want to ensure that um, there's a, a controls when it comes to the floor plate of buildings, um, ensure that there are step backs at the proper height, um, both in relation to mitigating wind impact, but also um, being responsive to uh, the context of the area. Um, and also ensuring that there's space between taller buildings. Um, so this introduces uh, two new regulation, two new regulations. Um, one, uh, a regulation to ensure that um, buildings over 150 feet um, step back um, when adjacent to each other um, at a uh, determined step back height. Um, and the and one thing that we explored here was having that step back height be determined um, one by the uh, you know the general um, height of the area downtown that's you know really the contextual height is 155 feet um, but also have that be responsive to any historic structures that are adjacent to the property um, and in the case of downtown um, or within zoning um, historic structures include not just structures that are landmarked um, or in the National Historic Register database, but also um, ones that have been uh, um, inventoried um, within MACRIS. Um, and this actually includes um, uh, about 95% of all buildings downtown. Um, and this ensures that um, uh, buildings that are going above 155 feet include um, some form of step back uh, that responds to adjacent buildings, um, uh, so the adjacent height of a building. Um, alongside these new form-based regulations, we want to make sure that um, you know historic buildings that uh, currently don't actually apply with some of these uh, um, new uh, new ways of both activating, ensuring more public realm, but also step backs. Um, that in these cases where um, there are opportunities for um, conversion, um, that uh, you know adaptive reuse can occur without the extra hurdle of, um, of variances from these new regulations. So um, this is where we're introducing um, uh, the provision to make sure that existing structures that don't conform to the proposed dimensional requirements can still be enlarged or altered. Um, as long as they're not um, increasing that nonconformity. The other element that we heard um, feedback on um, was in a similar uh, sense to the 
the dimensional regulations, um, the uh, the new triggers when it comes to use regulations, specifically um, making things like large scale office, commercial, lab, hotel, um, conditional above the above the fifty thousand square feet. Um, the concern here being um, if a project wants to um, uh, expand. Um, uh, which was a case in the recently completed one with Rip Square that they wouldn't then be triggering um, additional uh, linkage, additional development impact review um, uh, for that uh, um, rehab to um, their existing space. So alongside of this, uh, all of this, um, the goal here was to really set um, one, a more flexible building envelope that does have form regulations that tie to the context um, with the, uh, re re while recognizing the fact that um, zoning itself um, uh, must be paired with, you know, in case, some cases like for large, larger projects, um, additional design review to ensure alignment with the context with um, uh, specific site challenges. Um, and this is where we created alongside the zoning process, um, additional study into the historic context and creating um, more uh, downtown specific guidelines um, to ensure that um, we're shaping buildings specific to some of the needs of each area downtown. Um, so that, that's kind of the overview of Skyline Districts uh, overall, um, how we're, thinking of applying it to the downtown context, but also potentially elsewhere. Um, we also, as you know, part of plan downtown and looking at um, mapping um, opportunities in the area, um, uh, alongside that looked into how we then map um, these two districts um, and also deal with the multitude of different um, zoning districts that are in place. Uh, so th this is where, I have the number of Jill for, um, it's for 14 existing PDAs. Um, and then I think it's. Right, six, but those, I was thinking six, about the five or yeah. six that we made PDA eligible, five, six, seven. It was in the last 10 years, I think. Um, right, I think it's six, six areas. Um, those those areas. would go away with this. Exactly. Um, and uh, so the, the changes that we're proposing would, um, uh, immediately impact the Midtown Cultural District um, and the Boston proper area. Um, uh, while we're also proposing um, small boundary changes uh, with uh, Bay Village neighborhood district to ensure that um, some of the areas that really are a part of that district um, are moved over and included um, to align with how the district itself is structured. Um, but what we looked at when it came down to mapping the two districts was identifying, you know, the areas in which um, uh, can, you know, best accommodate uh, growth and height and density and the widest range of uses, which is really the Sky District um, versus the areas of um, cohesive uh, historic fabric. Um, in the case of downtown, this this area that we're um, mapping. Um, the ladder blocks and um, the corner of the wharf district uh, on the top right. Um, so again, looking at the two districts, um, the Sky District, uh, this is the area that allows larger retail and entertainment. Um, it has more active use and dimensional requirements. Um, it's in the case of this area where we're allowing um, height to the maximum uh, in, allowed under uh, critical airspace um, uh, from Logan Airport and then state shadow law, um, whichever the two is lower. Um, and it's this area that also research lab or labs are uh, conditional. And just a note on the height that's important is um, uh, the area on the, on the right is most affected by um, is really the taller zone that's uh, really just capped by uh, Logan Airport critical airspace. It's as you move to um, page, page left that um, the shadow law that protects uh, the common and the public garden from additional shadow kicks in. Um, and that's where the height maximum gets lower and lower as you approach the edge of the common. 
Um, the other zone, sky low, um, again, this is really uh, looking at um, the ladder blocks and and the key historic uh, fine-grained uh, core of uh, the wharf district. Um, this has a stricter limit on uses, use size. Um, and this is where we were setting a smaller allowed building floor plate, um, which is, uh, it's not, it's uh, now we're proposing 25,000 square feet. And it's in this zone that the height um, responds to um, the district itself and the common scale, which is 155 feet in the area. And um, it's in sky low that we can apply a overlay that um, sets both um, the height and then also the max floor plate that's appropriate to the area. So we see this as being um, when this might be applied elsewhere in the city. Um, these uh, the floor plate size and then the height itself can adjust um, to the, the the scale of the area. And so the the big change here is removing the Midtown Cultural District completely um, and uh, incorporating that into Skyline District. Um, and then some of the smaller changes include um, uh, tweaks to the government center and markets boundary. And again, um, uh, Bay Village incorporating uh, portions that were part of Midtown Cultural into Bay Village neighborhood district. One other element that we're pro proposing is actually removing the Greenway overlay district from the study area. Um, one thing that popped up was the fact that the Greenway overlay district uh, has a lot of this similar barriers that we're finding um, an existing zoning downtown, um, same type of uh, restrictions on ground floor uses that are um, uh, already outdated. Um, and that includes restrictions on takeout um, and uh, things like ice cream shops. Um, so this is where we see an opportunity to um, remove the overlay and ensure that there's consistency across the area. Which brings us to where we are now. Um, uh, so we've gone through, again, the, this process where back in April, we released a draft um, uh, followed by a two month public comment period. Um, we also released a draft of these uh, downtown historic design guidelines um, to also complement the zoning. Um, and we're still in the process of uh, you know, looking at um, how this is mapped and uh, some of the details of the draft text amendment in relation to some of the comments we, we received. Um, so looking forward, um, we hope to have, um, you know, release the uh, final draft um, by the end of the year, have another public meeting going over the changes um, before bringing it to uh, the board um, and then to you to review. Thank you, okay. Andrew. Thank you. Thank you so much for opportunity. Thank you. Does anyone have any more questions for Kathleen or Andrew? And I, I was curious. I saw Mike, Michael. Your name was in the um, uh, the group that was also involved with this. Mike Nichols. Uh, the yeah, our downtown bid um, certainly is a stakeholder of this process and tried to be. Uh, supportive of um, the vision to ensure that zoning downtown aligns with our future goals for the neighborhood. So thank you for your participation on that. I'm sure helped a lot. Does anyone else have any questions for any anyone? Yeah, I might. <clears throat> it's not a, actually, well, I guess it's a question uh, for, um, for Kathleen. Um, just so I understand this better, I think it's Great, we're making all these these changes, but I just so I understand it better as an example um, of how the um, sky low um, is would work. I mean, we, we had a, a good example in, in my neighborhood right on the edge of this with I think it's called 175 Lincoln, which is the old uh, an old uh, garage, uh, mid-century modern garage. Um, that was uh, being proposed for uh, uh, an R&D development, um, which is, uh, was considerably more height, um, something I actually was uh, supportive of in my neighborhood. But there was a lot of controversy about it, how it impacted 
the buildings adjacent uh, to it, which were of a more sort of historic scale. Um, if that were in, say, uh, adjacent